My name is Dahlia Kirschbaum. Um, I'm one of the executive committee members of Land Aware and, and founding members. And so we're really excited about this 24 hour session. And this hour, we're going to be focusing on um, landslide early warning system data. And so Ben and I um, co-lead a data working group as part of Land Aware. And in that group, we're really looking to uh, do a couple things. One, it's an open group and we welcome participation. But the first is we're looking to have a discussion on kind of data standards, understanding um, some of the requirements and the definitions of the types of data that are needed to both support and evaluate landslide early warning systems. Um, and to that end, we've talked about creating or establishing different information about benchmark data sets, particularly with respect to landslide uh, inventories. And, and that includes both the inventories themselves and potentially the methodologies behind them, which we'll hear a little bit about in this hour. Um, and then finally, we're working on um, really a white paper um, that will highlight some of the both best practices, but also the opportunities in this space to advance landslide early warning system data. And so before I introduce our three speakers, um, I just want to see if, if Ben has any additional um, information to, uh, to share with the group regarding our, um, our data working group. Thanks, Dahlia. Uh, no, I think you covered it all nicely and succinctly. And um, you know, I'll talk a little bit about my own work shortly, but uh, also just to add that we have another session at, oh, I don't know what time, European time, but in six hours from now. So I uh, look forward to seeing you all there. And that will be highlighting some younger um, uh, early career scientists and doing some lightning talks. So I um, look forward to seeing you there and uh, also the discussion at the conclusion of this, this hour. Well, thank you so much, Ben. Um, so as you mentioned, this is a, going to be a panel. And, um, and first, we are going to hear from three speakers that will provide a perspective on some of the new activities related to landslide inventories, the methodologies behind them, and some of the uh, more wide spread um, work going on at, at regional and continental scales. And then we're gonna have time for a panel discussion. And so I welcome questions. Um, please feel free to put them in the chat. We'll be monitoring the chat. And um, after every presentation, we'll have time for brief question and answer. And then we'll go into really a conversation to hear your thoughts, as well as um, get the panelists ideas of, of what's next. How can we move forward? So the three panelists we'll be hearing from today, um, the first one will be Olivier DeWitt, and he's a physical geographer at the Royal Museum for Central Africa. The second will be Florian Provost from the University of Strasbourg, and then it will be Ben Miras um, from the US Geological Survey. So Olivier, I invite you to present first. I think if you'd like to share your screen, um, that would be great, or um, Ben is ready to share the slides as well. So what's your preference? Yes, hello everyone. Thank you, Dalia, for the introduction. I'm trying to share my screen, but I'm not sure that I have the authorization for that. Maybe you have to put me the co-host. Okay. Uh, no, actually, you can uh, you can just uh, uh, press the, the the green button, uh, share screen, so everybody can share. Uh, uh, in the yeah, it says that my browser is preventing access to sharing screen. It's very strange. Okay. Well, fortunately, Ben is set with your slides. And so hopefully, I guess if you can just say next slide, um, we should be able to, um, to do it that way. Always have a backup. So thank you so much. Um, and I think, um, so Olivier, uh, take it away. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm going to bring you to the East African Rift. So Ben, if you can move to the next slide, please. Yes, the next slide. Sorry, there's a slight delay here. I'll, I'll figure it out shortly. Um, okay. Okay, yeah, so uh, I bring you in a region which is one of the landslide hotspots in Africa. So in the middle panel, you, you see the right rectangle. This is where we are going to be. So it's one of the hotspots in Africa, but most interestingly, it's uh, also at the global level, a hotspot of landslide exposure. So you have a very high population density there. You have millions of people. 
And then if you look at the projection of the future population, it's also one of the hotspots where population is expected to rise. So these are three key elements that motivate us to work in that region. Next slide, please. Yeah, it's going to slow down the presentation, I think. I think it should be the next slide. I'm sorry, there's a, a delay. Yep, I see it. Okay. Olivia, do you see the, the next slide? Okay, I, I don't see it, but uh, okay. I, I trust you. So yeah, <laughs> I see it. Yeah, there is a, a delay, so we will try to, to figure that out. So the, the region basically is very diverse uh, in terms of landscape. So you have one part, which is still a natural tropical forest, which has uh, under, uh, went through heavy deforestation over the last decades. Then you have also uh, heavily populated, uh, let's say, rural environments, big cities of several million people. Uh, but you have also, which is interesting here, is you have also different countries. So uh, clearly you have five countries uh, that are very poor. Uh, we are in the test task care context, and it's pretty difficult also to, to work, work, uh, to work across different borders and with different data sets. So next slide. Yep, it should be coming. Okay, so in that next slide, uh, you, you, you have just an overview of the type of landslides we have. So we want to work, uh, we want to assess the hazards. Uh, we want to assess uh, the understanding of these landslides but we have a huge variety of processes and from from this view we can always see that uh, some of these landslides are influenced by human activities so which is also one of the objectives that we have so next slide It, it should be showing. Um, I'll just let you know, yes, every time I change it. Okay, yeah. so you can already move to the next slide. I will do, I will go for the two together. So, so basically, we want to understand the landslide hazard. We want to uh, look at uh, natural and human induced factors that are behind. And we have a large region, which is data scale. So our strategy is to use different methods. Uh, but also to work at different scales. So we do work at regional scale, but we do work also on site-specific uh, investigations. And for those site-specific investigations, they are usually uh, uh, targeted based on the, the feedback and the interaction we have with the stakeholders. So we do work with local researchers, but also we do work with like civic protections, and they really highlight the places where the problem are. So uh, in the next slide, uh, I'm presenting uh, actually the first uh, regional inventory that we made in terms of landsliding. So that's about 20,000 landslides that we have mapped from Google Earth. So it works pretty well. We have uh, validated that information in the entire region. And we clearly show that there are two big populations of landslides. You have the old landslides, historical landslides, but you have also all the recent landslides. And most of those recent landslides are rainfall triggered. So the first step we, we had from this inventory was to build a regional susceptibility assessment uh, in order to have a product that performs better in terms of prediction skills than uh, the continental or the global susceptibility models. So that's the first regional step, uh, let's say. For the next slide, uh, I'll show there the, the second step where we want to know uh, basically when the landslides have occurred in a more accurate way, I mean, for the recent landslides. And we want to understand the rainfall conditions that are behind. So for that, we need to have an information which is very accurate at a daily resolution, I would say. Uh, and uh, again, keeping in mind that you have very little information. So we've managed to collect about 3,300 uh, data with accurate landslide timing, which is 
quite a challenge in this region, but which still quite a lot of a limited data set as compared to what you have, for example, in Italy. And based on that, we have already a first trend uh, in, in the next, the graph uh, number three shows this overall trend of the landslide, where we have a peak of landslide activity in May, which is like about one to two months after the peak of the rainfall. So that's already an indication about the, the role of the antecedent conditions into landslide activities. Next slide. So then to go further into the understanding of the rainfall thresholds, uh, we had to use uh, satellite data from TMPA, but also from uh, IMERG, uh, just for the fact that uh, over the region, we have only 50 rain gauges that are available, and uh, we had to install uh, 20 of them. Uh, there was no information for DRC and very little information for Uganda. So when we played with traditional threshold uh, information that was pretty difficult working on this region because we lacked of data. So we've developed a new threshold approach based on from one side antecedent rain uh, conditions and another side based on susceptibility assessment. And here um, on the right panel, uh, you have a map that shows this threshold susceptibility approach, which is a first step towards regional early warning system for the region. Next slide, please. So on this slide, uh, we look at the impact of deforestation. So deforestation has been important. So for that, we show for the recent landslides that uh, there is an increase in landslide activity that will usually last for duration of 15 years. And we also show that the impact of deforestation will be different according to the position in the landscape, uh, according to uh, the presence of fault, different the geological context, and so on. So that's the first understanding we have about the human activities at the regional level. Next slide. So then based on that assessment, we reconstructed the forest landscape over the last 70 years. We've managed to reconstruct this annually change of forest pattern that we could link with the landslide susceptibility induced by the deforestation. And we could also combine, because we have for 20 years the exact timing of the recent landslide, we could merge susceptibility to hazard, which allowed us here to show trends in landslidings. And uh, this uh, figure shows in a conceptual way all the interactions that are to be considered to understand the landslide hazard vulnerability and risk in the region. And we show that, for example, uh, in DRC, different governance has led to a much higher landslide risk than in the other countries. Next slide. So I was referring here to the regional assessment, but we have also case specific assessment here. This is next to the city of Bujumbura in Burundi. So there is more than 1 million inhabitants there. And you have many problems of landsliding, direct impacts, so where people live, uh, but also indirect impacts. And that's the example of the compound event that I show below. So where you have uh, landslide dams that are associated with heavy rainfall, then it breaches, then it increases the potential of a flash flood, and then kilometers down in the city, in that case, it killed more than 200 uh, people. So this kind of inventory uh, is also like highly field-based. Uh, historical information over 70 years and allow really to bring, uh, I mean, useful tools for the local uh, stakeholders. Next slide. So that's that one was a type of an uh, investigation, let's say, on the sub-region. Here, this is for a case-specific uh, analysis of a flash flood where we show the role of uh, forest fire and normal rainfall that has uh, triggered landslides, which led to a uh, debris-rich flash flood. This is a sort of process that we observe quite a lot in the region. Next slide. So here we look at also at the dynamic of, let's say, slow-moving landslides. So there are about 2,000 large landslides in the region that we have identified. Some of them are really active, like this one. And so here we, we wanted to understand how the landslide behaves. And uh, we could show that it is highly related to the rainfall seasonality, but we could also show that it responds very quickly to a small change into the humidity and soil moisture conditions. 
So we are currently investigating similar landslides also in urban contexts where we show that in addition to the natural behavior, the urban growth changes also the dynamic of the landslide. Next slide. So I highlighted a bit like the fact that we work with stakeholders and uh, we are in a region where we have very limited information. So we have also implemented citizen observer networks. So currently we have three networks in DRC and two uh, in Uganda. So about 75 people from local communities or civil protection have been trained to report about landslide events. Uh, usually it's more like oriented towards landslide that has impact, so the information is a little bit biased, but clearly just in a two-year work, we have been able to collect five to 600 new accurate landslide information, which is much more than what we used to have from, let's say, traditional archives or traditional information that we get from, from the internet. Next slide, please. And here, that's, a, that's the last uh, research initiative that we started about one year ago. So we want also to get more information at the regional level from satellite images. And we want to have an accurate idea of the timing of those landslides. So here we use uh, SAR images to detect uh, the occurrence of new events. We use SAR because we are in cloud covered conditions. And so through this tool, we are able to constrain the timing to an accuracy of about two to four days, which is much higher than what we can have with traditional optical remote sensing. And I think, okay, that was basically one of the last slides, and I will, I will stop here uh, because I'm running a bit out of time. So thank you, and I'm ready to, to go for the questions. Well, thank you so much, Olivier. Um, I, I welcome anyone. Um, does anyone have a question? Um, specifically for his presentation. All right, well, I I have one, um, you know, I guess just technical and then I have some bigger picture questions we can talk about later, but Olivia, related to the citizen science networks, could you speak a little bit more about, you know, participation and activity and kind of the value of the information that you were able to extract um, from the, the citizen science efforts in that region? I think there's a lot of people that are, somewhat skeptical on, you know, about how we can use landslide data. So I was just curious if you can have had any takeaways thus far in engaging the community on some of these science, um, citizen science yeah. activities. So uh, first of all, uh, for, for engaging the communities, so we are not ourselves uh, interacting with them. So mm -hmm. we have local partners, local researchers, or like the city protection and themselves, they contact their communities and then meeting the local communities, they ask like, do you have people that you trust that are willing to do that work? Uh, there is no financial incentive directly. So it's based on, uh, I mean, voluntary uh, commitment where, I mean, we, we cover like trouble expenses. And what we see is that they become highly motivated. They get to know their community better. Uh, they raise awareness and we have also contact constantly with them uh, to, to train. Uh, we go in the field, we check uh, their, their reports as well. So, I mean, we collect information, but in the meantime, we contribute to awareness raising a lot in the region. And then progressively, you have people that are more and more involved and interact with us in an informal, informal way, like even WhatsApp groups and this kind of information. Well, you mostly so addressed... Positive. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's excellent, both as an awareness building campaign, but in actually getting data in. And um, Mariana actually asked a similar question. And so I think that you you pretty much fully answered it. Um, and it's specifically, I guess, just in terms of the um, uh, the quality checking. So, you know, based on citizen reports, do you, you do go in the field when you're able to kind of quality check these types of observations? What, what they do is that they work with smartphones. So when they have an app where they report the event with lots of details in terms of information, timing, impact, size uh, of the events, cause. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, they also have to submit uh, photos with that. So okay. everything that is sent uh, to a local coordinator who is checking all the reports and checking if everything looks logical. And when there is photos missing or something like this, they call back the citizen observers. 
just to, to let them know what has happened, what was wrong. So there is this quality, quality check, which is constantly being done. And then I would say two to three times a year, local coordinators and maybe with me or with some colleagues here in Belgium, we go together in the field and we go to check and we have twice per year, let's say, refreshing sessions where we share technical concerns, we make updates, updates of the app, and I mean, additional training based on the questions as well. So it's a uh, work which is constantly uh, in, in progress, I would say. Well, excellent. Well, thank I, you I so much. I have a follow-up question. Um, Please. We can maybe get to a little more in the discussion, I guess, as well, if there's time. But um, I guess I was just curious, you've got information coming in from the citizen scientists, um, and you've got kind of these journal articles and papers. I, I wonder what, um, is there any flow of information the other way where you're presenting kind of the inventory or the susceptibility results kind of in a more general format that the public or, or local officials can use? Yeah. So for example, I didn't show that here, uh, but we have very accurate maps for some cities. And I did show the, the example of Bujumbura, but that's a work which is not published yet. But for another work uh, in the city of Bukavu, we have built uh, hazard and risk assessment maps and everything was designed together with with the local uh, authorities and stakeholders. Because just even going in the field, uh, questioning people, it's uh, something that needs to be discussed and, and, and decided. And so, and also the way, uh, which kind of administrative zone we target, which uh, We don't hear you. I think we, yeah, Olivier, we somehow you got cut, you cut off. Oh, it looks like it's Olivier. Can you hear us? Kind of people, which are blind. Okay. That can open. Yes. Oh, it looks like the audio was a little a little cut off at the end, but um, but I think I, I think the um, I think that it's okay. a really important point. Okay. Um, well, I think we're going to move on, if that's okay, um, to Florian. Um, Olivia, thank you so much. And, and he's going to stay on so we can have some additional discussion at the end of this hour. Um, so I'd like to now introduce uh, Florian Provost from the University of Strasbourg. Right? Um, and, um, and so she is going to follow on um, and, and speak about some of the methodologies of how we can develop inventories and um, some examples. So. Um, so Florian, would you like to share your screen? Is that going to be the easiest? Yes. Perfect. Everyone Looks see? great. Perfect. I'll just, um... All right. So hi everyone. I'm Florian Provost. So I'm currently at the University of Laval in Quebec. I just moved, and I'm going to present uh, indeed some methodology on how we can use in particular uh, optical image correlation to construct uh, landslide inventories. It's a work I've been initiating during my research fellow at the European Space Agency and that I'm currently following. So it's mostly preliminary results, sorry. And I will just like give some of the ideas I can have on these subjects. So and we we're actually oh, just, we're not, I'm not seeing the slides unless others no. are. No, we um, don't so maybe see. just try to reshare or um, take it out of hmm. full screen again. Do you see? Okay, like so I see that. I see yeah. it that way. Yeah, yeah but oh, let's, okay. yeah, start from the beginning. Yeah, I'm not going full screen. So basically, landslides. Uh, so recently, we've seen like a lot of uh, new constellations being uh, launched uh, into space uh, for, especially for optical and radar satellites. Uh, in particular, we had recently the launch of Sentinel-2, but also in private, with private companies like Planet that uh, have very high resolution uh, satellites that have a visit time of one day. Uh, Sentinel-2 is rather uh, low resolution with 10 meter pixel, but it's quite fair. And it has a risk time of five days uh, in most part of the world. So that leads us to very large archives of data uh, with some of them uh, having open access policy, which gives uh, new challenges in terms of access visualization and also exploitation of these data sets because it gives a lot of information everywhere around the world, but it's really difficult to analyze uh, manually uh, each acquisition. So, 
Uh, there are different methods to use uh, satellite imagery to construct landslide inventory. And the most basic one is to analyze the change detection that we can see through time in images or radar images. So it's what you see on the left uh, images. So you see the removal of the vegetation in this case that we can easily map the, the evolution of the landslide. But you can also uh, use more advanced products such as uh, velocity maps that, are, that can be computed, for example, by INSAR technologies or approaches. And you can, from this velocity map, uh, set some criteria to actually build your landslide inventory. So that the most uh, used uh, approaches so far to uh, build landslides uh, inventories from uh, remote sensing imageries. And as you can see, they split, I mean, they, they, they can detect landslide in different range of activities. So INSAR is sensitive to very slow motion with uh, a velocity of centimeter per year. Uh, more or less, and change detection is very sensitive to quite fast uh, landslide with uh, either like metric deformation in, several, in a few seconds or metric deformation in some days. And in the middle, you can use kind of image correlation that is sensitive to landslides that are faster than the one detected by INSAR, but will not be able to detect necessarily very fast landslide. So that's the first work I've been doing during my, my postdoc is uh, to create a, an algorithm to compute the creation of the images and retrieve stacks of displacement fields. Uh, there are many other algorithms available, but this one has been uh, given on a high computer, uh, HPC, a high performance computer on Strasbourg and is available through different platform online to any user. So you can also apply for it. And basically, we improve the, the processing chain by uh, additional, with additional filtering and masking. Uh, we also have automatic download of the Sentinel-2 images. And we provide at the end as output statistical estimation uh, through like analyzing the stack of displacement fields. But also, we provide the displacement time series with the TU algorithm that has been developed in Easter by Pascal Lacroix and Marie-Pierre Douin and uh, Noël Bontemps. And so as an example of the result we can have from this kind of chain, processing chain, is what we obtain on the Swangolian landslide with the Sentinel-2 uh, archive from 2015 to 2020. And you can see that you can retrieve a uh, motion of millimeter per day and it's nicely complementary to Sentinel-1 uh, products uh, that you can obtain using INSA. So now the main question is really how to exploit the special and temporal information that you can obtain with image correlation to build up uh, landslide inventory and possibly detect changes in deformation regime. So going at the regional scale now, that's the kind of uh, results you can obtain in the Uber Valley in the French Alps. And you can see that here you get like a lot of noise uh, on the on different uh, mountainous area, but you can also detect uh, the mainland slide of this region. So the Lavalette, Bosch and Sanya landslide are clearly visible in the mean velocity. But then because of this noise that is due to DEM errors or shadowing effects, it's very difficult to consider a simple velocity threshold. So Stumpf et al. in 2017 proposed another criteria that is based on the analysis of the principal component of the motion through time. And it tested uh, like his, his criteria is the coherency of the vectors through time. So it's trying to detect if the movement is constant uh, in his orientation. So we are looking for this kind of motion that is like going always in the same direction, but can vary through time. Uh, and we are uh, not looking for noise that is rather a slow motion that has no magnitude uh, or some magnitude movement, but with really erratic direction uh, through time. So if we just look at this kind of movement and apply this criteria, we see that we can nicely detect uh, the landslide of the region as I showed you earlier. And that's the result. So that's the probability of uh, being a landslide that you can see here as R. And so you can 
nice to see those uh, landslide being detected. You also have some false um, detection on vegetated areas, but it's, I mean, no, no methodology is perfect. So you still have to go through the results, but it, do, it does like most of the work selecting uh, like the, the right areas and then you can remove lesser information of a very wide area. So um, uh, among the different criteria Stump had tested, which was including like different criteria on the principal coordinate analysis, but also the mean velocity, it was the one performing better to retrieve uh, correctly the landslide and remove uh, as much as possible false, uh, false detection. But the limitation is that it, uh, it doesn't detect changes of the deformation. And if the pattern of landslide is more complex than just being linearly uh, and constant through time, it, through space, it will be not detected by this simple criteria. So uh, we need to like, consider new approaches that can both detect uh, changes in time and space uh, of landslide behavior. And for that, we can consider either independent competent analysis or principal content analysis, but in a different way and machine learning approaches. So that's the work I'm starting to uh, pursue. It has been developed for volcanic sources with the Comet group. So I'm kind of uh, trying to see what they are doing and try to adapt it to the landslide problem. And so basically, if we talk about ICA, PCA decomposition, uh, the principle of independent component analysis is that a spatial temporal signal is uh, composed of independent sources, either in time or space. So, and you can retrieve the sources uh, by performing ICA analysis. And so I have tested this approach on two different sites on the Lavalet and the egg wheel landslides, they are both located in the French Alps. And the lavalette is what I uh, shown you already earlier. It has a very uh, constant direction through time and linear behavior, while the egg wheel landslide has a more complex behavior because it has evolved very rapidly in the past years with an acceleration, strong acceleration in 2017. And like different blocks have moved uh, in the last years. So his behavior is really much more complex in space and time. So if we look at the lavalet first, so the easiest case, uh, we, I decided to separate the signal into uh, 20 sources, assuming there were like 20 independent sources in time. And I computed that over uh, more than 1,600 displacement grids and 87 acquisition dates. And that's the results of the sources I can extract from all source data. So that the sources in east-west uh, direction and north-south direction. And basically you can see that the signal of the landslide can be nicely retrieved on those two sources uh, in east-west and north-south direction. And you can uh, isolate other sources that are more noisy sources due to whatever reason uh, on the correlation it can be clouds or DM errors or vegetation changes that can be detected. Uh, I'm not showing you the result, but if you reconstruct the signal using only those two sources, you nicely reduce the noise in your uh, time series and in your mean uh, velocity estimation. But you can also detect these sources uh, through this uh, thing. And then using the same method on, on the EGRI lens slide, you can see that in this case, you can detect uh, several sources that can be linked to the landslide uh, deformation. And all of them show that different blocks are moving. And I'm not showing you that here neither, but you can have the time occurrence of the motion of these blocks and what are their time series respectively. And the only problem now is that this method is really sensitive to the number of sources you set as input. And uh, it's also very difficult and yet to actually estimate which sources is linked to the landslide. Because here you can see that you have like point uh, sources somehow, but you also have them in many other uh, results like other sources displayed here at other location. And the only way you know that it's part of the landslide is because you already mapped the uh, 
location of the landslide. So they are further work to do to completely uh, classify and analyze both the coherence of the sources through time and their occurrence in, in time. And this is what you can do using uh, probably like machine learning approaches, like neural network networks that you can apply to those different um, uh, special temporal information to try to uh, classify different sources and their occurrence through time. And that's something that, I, that is doing, that has been done currently with volcanic uh, sources. And the big question is to know if we can apply that for regional analysis of uh, landslides and build inventories from those kind of approaches. So that's basically uh, uh, the end of my presentation. So you can see that optical image correction is a very important, very interesting source of information and very complementary to in some measurements as well as uh, change detection. Um, it can, it's really important to consider this, uh, this set of information to build ex exhaustive landslide inventories. And it also can be very interesting to monitor the signs of activation in near real time of landslide because it's sensitive to larger uh, motion than INSAR uh, approach. And so there are still a lot of work to do on the methodology to expose this kind of uh, special temporal information, especially with uh, this new area where we have a lot of uh, data every day over very large uh, regions. And yeah, like ICA, PCA, and machine learning are definitely uh, a new perspective to think of to construct in the future alongside inventories. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Excellent, excellent slides and, and excellent work. Um, do we have any questions? Um, feel free to put them in the chat. Well, I'll, I'll start. So, I mean, I think that, you know, Olivia touched on this a bit as well as you, um, in terms of, you know, following a major rainfall event when it's still cloud covered, you know, SAR data offers this opportunity to get a sense of the distribution of, of landslides. And so with the kind of ICA, PCA um, approach that you are presenting, to what extent do you think that this method could be applicable to help, you know, develop a, a map after a major hurricane or tropical cyclone, um, you know, or could it be used for a heat map and then would need to be further refined? I was just kind of curious kind of where you see that type of approach maybe playing a role in disaster response to landslides. Or this is a response such as like major typhoon or things like that. I'm not sure this is a method for building a, an inventory after those kind of things because I'm really looking at the, the evolution through time. Like I, I need a lot of acquisition to get the ground motion through different dates mm -hmm. to then extract like the behavior of the landslide. So if I just have one acquisition such as what mm -hmm. we're looking at after those kind of major events, I cannot apply this kind of methodology. So I'm mm -hmm. more interested into like uh, either like building active through dormant landslide inventories and detect like new activity of landslide that were inactive in the past years. Interesting. But with really like uh, slow motion uh, landslide. And, and then the other application for that is to see what are the trigger of like uh, acceleration and uh, go further in the in the understanding of what is triggering the deformation of landslides. But I would say yes, it's not applicable for disaster response. So. I have sort of a follow up question or maybe a discussion point related to that. So, um, at some point, is there sort of a threshold at which point you are confident something is a landslide? You've had enough motion. Uh, uh, events detected of motion, and you're confident that you could set up some sort of an automated, you know, you've already have the, the automated detection um, and identification. At some point, you would have some rule that you know it's a landslide, and you can kind of automatically export it into some sort of a centralized inventory, or is there, is it kind of still a little bit of an expert opinion art of, of selection, I guess? So far, it's really familiar. 
okay it's really like uh i'm i'm currently playing with because it's okay uh that's the final goal to be able to like use those data to build a plant size inventory on very like uh, objective uh, criteria because it also provides objective criteria somehow that you don't have like an expert uh, providing the interpretation of the landslide so you can also uh, like uh, make it more objective but uh, as I shown you like uh, we don't have results so far at very large areas and we don't use them uh, so far at, with optical data uh, to build a plant slide. But I know that in Italy, uh, you have several uh, groups that presented the, how they use INSAR data uh, to build the plant slide inventories in Tuscany and then on the whole Italy. And so I don't know how much it is like used on a daily basis to update the long slide inventory, but it's where everyone is, I think, going forward uh, to, to use those kind of inputs to improve the, the updates of long slide inventories. Well, thank you very much. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. So um, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, oh, so I'd like to welcome um, Ben to present um, from the uh, US Geological Survey on some of the recent work he's been doing in uh, the continental United States. So Ben. Oh, you're muted. Uh, yeah, the there mute button moved on me when I started sharing my screen. <laughs> this is not Looks where it great. Was before. Thanks. Um, yeah, so thanks, Dolly, and thanks to the previous presenters. I'm kind of taking a zoom back and, and looking a little bit at um, just compiling and maintaining an exist uh, uh, a uh, national scale inventory so that we can use these for improved national susceptibility mapping and, and early warning capabilities. And so this is a landslide in Puerto Rico um, following Hurricane Maria in the background here. Let's see if I can get the slides to change. Um, I'll just quickly note that all the uh, all the material is that are you know from this paper that Valley and I and I many others are co-authors on in landslides. Um, or in the, the kind of references therein. Um, but we have landslides in every US state. Here's some one uh, big deep seated landslide in North Carolina, a big lot of debris flow in Colorado, and then all up and down the West Coast, the kind of the three main mountain ranges in the US, the, the Appalachia, um, Rocky Mountains, and the coast ranges in Sierra Nevada. Um, it's a huge area. And one of the issues is we, we have very sporadic landslide warning systems. This is from uh, Bowen back 2010, showing just the, the kind of dispersed and variable uh, coverage of landslide warning systems across the US. So on the right uh, is the landslide intensity duration, uh, rainfall intensity duration thresholds with the kind of Gazetti and, and Kane uh, thresholds shown for reference. Um, and then the map on the left just kind of shows that, that spotty coverage with that specific uh, cities like Seattle or the San Francisco Bay Area, some states that actually issue landslide outlooks um, in terms of the weather forecast. But overall, really kind of sparse coverage given the large land service area that we have in the United States. Um, and this is also a pretty broad assessment of landslide susceptibility. Right now, we just have maps for the continental US. On the left is a fairly old geologically based landslide susceptibility map does show that really in every state we have uh, potential for higher or moderate landslide susceptibility. Um, and on the right is a just topographically based assessment a little bit more recently using um, course resolution topography. And then um, if I go a little further in time, um, oops, I got to switch back. Uh, this is just the, the continental US extracted from the Lassa uh, Stanley and Kirschbaum model which was pretty similar to the topography-based model, but a little higher resolution, different hazard zonation. And again, it just shows we have landslide hazards all over this huge area of the United States. Um, and so uh, we have this over 9 million square kilometers of land area. I mentioned landslides in every state and just a wide variety of ecosystems and hydroclimatic environments, arid deserts with the post wildfire debris flows, and, and then in Alaska, uh, post-glacial and, and even permafrost thaw and melt related landsliding. Um, and we've got population expanding into landslide prone areas and suburbs around many major cities. 
increasing level of, of deforestation and wildfire that's increasing potential susceptibility to landsliding. And in January of 2021 of this year, um, a new law was signed in the National Landslide Preparedness Act, which authorizes the USGS with other federal agencies to come up with a national strategy for landslide hazard assessment and risk reduction. And so in kind of anticipation of that, we kind of knew that we need to put together something at the national scale. And right now we have all these different state geological surveys, each with different mandates uh, in terms of funding and even goals for collecting landslide data that are responsible for landslide mapping. Uh, we don't have a federal landslide mapping program. We do have other federal agencies with different jurisdictions and priorities, and we'll talk a little bit about a few of those. But um, ultimately, there was kind of a real need for getting all this together um, and the huge variety in terms of the data. So we've got some people mapping in response to specific events, some kind of systematically mapping um, entire states and some states with no mapping at all. Um, and so our goal with this was to, to integrate all available landslide data across the United States and uh, sort of with, the, with in mind of providing a centralized access to landslide data and also um, kind of try to set future precedents for what information is really important to mapping landslides and to developing landslide early warning systems. And so um, in developing some standards for, for landslide characterization and data confidence. Um, we had a lot of challenges that we kind of did, some of them we anticipated when starting to put this together and some of them we did not. Um, kind of what, what level of minimum data quality did we need to include something in, in the national data set? Is there any essential or superfluous data that we wanted to actually present at the national scale that maybe isn't available everywhere across the nation? How do we update these databases in a sustainable way? Um, and how do we include data sets that aren't necessarily publicly available elsewhere? We have some publication standards and some review standards that I won't get into, but this is a challenge to kind of figure out what all are we gonna to put together at the national scale and how are we gonna make it available? Um, so kind of the interest of time, I, I, we started with uh, the NASA's Global Landslide Catalog. This was a kind of benchmark to, to start moving forward and figure out, and thanks to Dahlia and Thomas for their guidance on, on, on how they developed this and how we could move forward with a national scale inventory. This is, uh, this data set was put together specifically with the, the GLC, the, um, uh, landslide early warning systems in mind. And so it, it typically includes dates of landslide occurrence and it has thousands of points uh, within the United States. Um, but not a lot of other information necessarily is, is required for inclusion in this. Um, and it does have really good coverage across all 50 states. Uh, so that was a really nice start for us. Um, and then we began the process of collecting other individual states like Oregon here shown in North Carolina. Um, Washington, and then also USGS papers and publications that existed over the, the previous decades, and of course, NASA's GLC to put together a centralized access to, point to all landslide information, whether that be from the last few years or the last uh, few hundred years. So uh, this was funded by the Landslide Hazards Program, USGS Landslide Hazards Program, and the Community for Data Integration. So some of the data integration um, questions were interest across the United, uh, United States Geological Survey. And it integrates all the publicly available data we could find, um, but that list is growing. And one of the things we found is that when you start creating a centralized place for people to share data, more people want to share that data, to share their own data, whether it's available or not through this through the system. And so uh, one of the key things that we did was come up with a very simplified and uniform attributes list. And I'll get to that in a second. Um, and we also really didn't want to be taking credit for this data. And so what we're doing is emphasizing this is an access point to landslide data and pointing every single landslide if someone clicks on it, we'll divert them back if they want to, to the original source information, whether that be the GLC or a state survey or a USGS publication. Um, so we have about half the landslides mapped in the United States as, as Italy has mapped. So we know that this is incomplete. There's many, many more landslides we know we need to map across the United States. Um, but this is a pretty good start, we felt, in putting things together. And this was published in 2019 as a data release, and you can access this through the link. I'll put that in the chat later. Um, I wanted to take one minute to, to talk about the semi-quantitative confidence metric we developed. And this was 
Stephen Slaughter's idea, Stephen is the, was with the Washington Geological Survey and now is with, with us at the USGS. And he thought it was really important to demonstrate that there's different techniques for mapping landslide and they have different uh, levels of confidence in terms of whether a landslide even occurred or not. And so we recognize that there's some media reports of a landslide that may not actually even be a landslide, but we don't have the capability to go through and check every 300,000 landslides in our database, but we do have a method to um, kind of assign a confidence based on how we know that that data was collected. And so we have this high confidence in the nature and extent of landslide as, as an eight out of eight. Um, and that was used, mapped either using LIDAR or high resolution aerial imagery or some of the techniques that have been mentioned in the previous two talks that we know it's a landslide, we know it's been well characterized, we know the position accuracy, and we know even some details about the nature of slope failure. Um, and then that kind of progressively goes down to, to moderate confidence, confidence and even kind of fairly low confidence in terms of a, like a one where it's possible that this is a landslide that happened somewhere in this vicinity that may have um, impacted a road or structure or something, but we aren't exactly sure. And so what this allows is kind of um, researchers or even just the general public to kind of have a sense of how clear the landslide information is for a given, any given landslide point. Um, and so those were developed based on kind of logical rules of how the data is collected, attributes within the comp component data sets, and we have scripts and all this stuff. But I won't get into that for time considerations. But ultimately, we distilled our landslide inventory at the national scale down to a really limited list of attributes. We have an object ID, and, and um, the key thing that I wanted to include was the date. And many, many, many landslides uh, in the U.S. have no date, but we wanted to set the precedent for developing landslide early warning systems. If you have that date, and ideally even the timing information, then that's really going a long way towards improving our landslide hazard risk reduction. And so uh, this this is a screenshot from two landslides that are actually the same landslide um, in two different inventories that we've ingested and highlight kind of a couple points. It's that different inventories have totally different information. On the left, this is from the NASA. Um, GLC, where they've stripped this from a media report. And so the notes here, the unformatted notes section shows basically information on from the media report about the landslide. It has um, the exact, well, more or less the exact time that the landslide occurred and the number of fatalities. Um, and, but the attributes is just an object ID, the date, whether any fatalities occurred, confidence that we I just talked about, where that inventory came from. So in this case, NASA, their uh, ID, so this is NASA's 7,337th land side, and then links to more information about this. On the right-hand side is the U.S. Forest Service has done mapping all across uh, the Alaska Tongass National Forest, and so they very nicely mapped the polygons, which you can see here. They have not recorded fatalities, and they've not recorded the exact date and time, and so these two, two land sides, which are actually the exact same land side, have very different information we have not gone through and kind of tried to amalgamate all those. That would be kind of a Herculean effort that we ultimately might like to do. Um, but again, by, by having this really simplified attributes list, we're actually demonstrating what is the most important um, in terms of collecting landslide data, for risk reduction, and landslide early warning systems. Um, and so, you know, the, a lot of success we've had in terms of this led to the identification of many more inventories. This kind of snowball effect that people have contacted us. We want to include our inventory in your in your database, and so we're coming out with a, an update this year. Um, it's allowed some national scale assessment of susceptibility and other things in, in data availability and, the, and data needs. And as I mentioned, we, we only have only three hundred thousand land sites. We know you know based on other places and just looking at the map, there's many, many, many more to map. Um, we've also in addition to kind of developing these benchmarks, we've received requests for additional guidance on inventorying and, and how to get more landslide information into our database. But there's still really ongoing data challenges, management challenges, which I'm happy to talk offline with people about. Um, each new data set we get is completely unique. And so ultimately, maybe everyone is going to start mapping landslides in the same way, but I think that's, that's unlikely. Um, and huge areas we still have to cover. So. The big thing I want to end with is, is there's a big public confusion about the difference between landslide occurrence and landslide susceptibility. And that's something we're, we're struggling with how to communicate in a simple way. Um, when people pull up our map and they see this really patchwork uh, network of landslide mapping, uh, how, how do you let them know that just because there isn't a landslide at a point that it's safe from landslides and just because there is a landslide at a point that um, it, 
may not necessarily be the, the most hazardous area. Um, but that's maybe a, a different topic for another day. So um, we have maybe about five minutes left for discussion questions and uh, maybe even a break for everyone. So thanks, uh, Dahlia and everyone for your attention. Thank you so, so much, Ben, covering some very ha highly topical and also um, you know, expansive area in terms of how to address this landslide inventory challenges. Um, you know, I wanna be mindful of, of giving everybody a few minutes break. Um, so I wanna just see if we can, I, I don't see any questions in the chat, though please feel free to put them there for Ben or others. Um, you know, I wanted to just ask each of the panelists very briefly, and then we'll close with one question, which is, what do you see, you know, we're, we're dealing with the land aware network, improving and advancing early landslide early warning systems. Foundational to that is the data, right? How can we develop the product? So what do you see as the biggest challenge or opportunity or both in, in, in growing this landslide inventory databases to support landslide early warning? Let's just start with, yeah, challenge and opportunity. Um, and so I'm gonna go backwards. So first I'll ask Ben and then uh, Florian and then Olivier, you know, what do you see going forward as, as those two things to really grow uh, uh, the public databases? Um, in one word, the, the challenge is, not one word, but briefly, the challenge is where, where to put and host all the data, where is that? <laughs> potentially going to be, um, be housed. And I think the opportunity is there's so much data out there and there's a lot of willingness to share it and a lot of new techniques There's going to be so much data. I think we're, we won't know what to do with it all. So um, there's a lot of great challenges and opportunities with, with the amount of data. And if anything that Ben just said inspires you, please consider joining our data working group as part of LandAware, which we will be directly discussing these types of questions. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Um, Florian, uh, are you? Uh, yes, so definitely the data are growing and there are many of them. So on the methodology like machine learning and such kind of things can definitely give a lot of answers or provide different information to that we don't have access to yet. And but it requires still a lot of time to parameterize them to have like um, uh, running, uh, sorry, like we need to classify to, to have some basis to, 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 to use those kind of uh, methodology most of the time. So maybe we can also give some, uh, we would have some project where people can help us like mapping lot slides uh, in a very general gaming basis or stuff like that and see what can, could be the output of those kind of uh, approaches uh, to speed up the, the work. That's, I love that idea. Gamification of landslide mapping. Yes, please. <laughs> um, Olivier. Yeah, uh, as a challenge, I mean, collecting unbiased data. I mean, from what I can observe, uh, it's usually people are just looking at the, the impact, uh, direct impact along roads or houses, something like this. So trying to, to make a differentiation between what is actually impactful and what is actually occurring. And then uh, opportunity, I would say like, yes, merging satellite uh, information and citizen-based information. I mean, I speak mostly for the environment where I work, but I think it's a nice opportunity as well. Excellent. Well, I want to thank all of the panelists. Um, I see some questions coming in in the chat, so I welcome you to stay on and, and maybe address some of those um, those questions as they're coming in. That looks like you're already doing that. Um, thank you so much. Um, this closes out our data um, session, and in about five hours now, we will have another one where we'll feature flash talks from early career scientists. Um, so with that, I'm going to close out our hour. Thank you all again, and please consider joining our data working group to continue more on this topic. Thanks, Daya. Thanks. Everybody.